everything you need to fight the Trump administration. This is The Bill Press Show, live at youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Hurricane Michael the Monster Storm, now a Category 4, barreling toward the panhandle of Florida and expected to hit land about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Get out of there if you're anywhere in the area. Hello, everybody. What do you say? Happy Wednesday. Here we go. A big Wednesday. Wednesday, October 10. So good to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Bill Press Show with lots and lots to talk about, as always. Uh, lots. We will bring you up to date on all the news of the day, whether it's a hurricane front in Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, or whether it's still the continuing Supreme Court front here in the, in, uh, the nation's capital. Uh, and Donald Trump on the campaign trail again out in Iowa, uh, the only man, the only president we've seen who campaigns for president all four years of his presidency. Might as well because he doesn't get anything else done. We'll tell you uh, what's going on and look forward to hearing from you and your comments on the news of the day. A big surprise with the resignation yesterday of our ambassador to the United Nations. Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, there less than two years, who just abruptly pulled the plug, surprised the hell out of everybody, although reportedly she told Donald Trump she was thinking about that a, a couple of months ago. She is out. We have no idea who might be in. Could it be the president's daughter or son-in-law? He's actually talking about it. Get ready. Your comments, ready to go on Twitter, at BP Show, at BP Show. And we will uh, get all into all the news of the day. But first, this is the Full Court Press. Just a couple of other stories making news. Let's say happy birthday to Anthony Mancinelli. Anthony, he, happy birthday. Happy birthday. He, he is a barber in New Windsor, New York, and he runs a uh, barber shop called Fantastic Cuts. Now, we wish him a happy birthday because he just turned 107 years old, mm. and he's still cutting hair, by the way. He is the world's oldest barber, I guess. If does that's he a, stand up to do it? He does indeed. He cuts hair. He says... He still works five days a week from noon to 8 p.m. He's been working in barbershops since he was 11 years old. And, uh, and by the way, when he started working in barbershops when he was 11 years old, the president was oh. Warren G. Harding. Oh, God, really? Oh. <laughs> that's how long this guy's been cutting hair. And that's amazing to me. Uh, so anyway, happy birthday. Happy birthday. He's had the record as oldest working barber since 2007, back when he was, you know, a spry 96 years old. Does he have any customers? I he still he has does. customers, and they've been coming to him for years. I wonder what he charges. I don't know. Mm. You know what, man? Retire. Yeah. Just retire. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. keep working, buddy. You're 107. Uh, we've talked about baseball playoffs this week. Baseball fever is uh, in full pitch. And last night... The Boston Red Sox beat the New York Yankees to win their series three games to one. So we are down to essentially the final four, Bill. It's the Dodgers that will be taking on the Brewers. And game one begins Friday night. And it's the Red Sox versus the Astros. And that game, that their game one will happen on Saturday night. So do you have any, any favorites here? I guess you would say L.A., right? I'd love to see the Red Sox and the Dodgers. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? I I like the Houston Astros a lot. I'd like to see them win again. That would be fun to see them go back to back. But yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, also, it, I mentioned a, a story in New York. Here's another story from New York. Some students went to go to their driving instructor this past weekend to get some lessons, you know, driving lessons, and they complained that he was acting a little strange. So they looked into it. It turns out he was drunk. He was drunk. The driving instructor was. Teaching kids how to drive while over the legal limit, not good. The first thing you're supposed to learn, right, when you're learning to drive is <laughs> yeah. don't drive and drink. That's it. Or drink and drive. This is The Bill Press Show. 
And Nikki Haley says, take this job and shove it. I want to get out of here, Mr. President. Yeah, well, not exactly. She slobbered all over him as she was leaving. Uh, but she is out, or soon will be out, as um, uh, UN, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations by her own choice, stepping down after less than two years. Hello, hello, what do you say? Good to see you today. Wednesday, October 10. How about it? Lots to talk about here on the Bill Press Show. Good to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us and climbing on board as we start off. The next two hours, we'll be bringing you up to date on all the news of the day, wherever it's happening on uh, in this country or around the globe. We'll uh, give you the latest, our take on the news of the day, and look forward to hearing from you as, pardon me, what you think about it all. Send us your comments on Twitter, at BP Show, at BP Show, as we join you every which way we can. Online on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Check it out. We haven't told you about our podcast for a while because it just keeps plugging along, but it's very, very important uh, that you check out the podcast at BillPressShow.com or wherever you go for your podcast and uh, sign up. Two things. Then once you get there, please sign up and rate us. Let us know what you think about the podcast. That's very helpful to us. And then you'll be hearing back from us with all kinds of uh, special stuff that we put up on the podcast even over the weekends when we are not on the air live it's it's very easy to do and as you mentioned you know the weekend podcast that we put up on saturdays covers a lot of stuff that we don't have time to necessarily get to on the show or special content like you just did a series where you read a bunch from your uh your your book book. right Uh, we get a a couple of uh, episodes on that uh this past weekend we did something on amazon raising the minimum wage so there's like there's a lot of content out there Right. So but you got to uh, subscribe. Got to subscribe. Check it out. Also, uh, happy to join you on Free Speech TV, coast to coast, as well as on the radio statewide in Indiana on Indiana Talks, where Joe Donnelly will be reelected the next United States senator and out in the greater Chicago area um, with two great senators, Tammy Duckworth and uh, Dick Durbin, as well. We are there on WCPT, the great progressive voice of Chicago. And all eyes on Hurricane Michael. It is now, was a tropical storm. It's uh, jumped up to a hurricane and jumped up actually now to a hurricane, a Category 4 hurricane. Uh, Just one step down from the most dangerous of all. But this is pretty lethal, very lethal. Packing winds of 140 miles an hour expected to hit the Gulf Coast uh, and the uh, the Panhandle uh, at uh, about 2 o'clock today. East Coast time today, this afternoon, um, with uh, if it remains at a Category 4, uh, scientists uh, are telling us this will be the most, the strongest storm, the most lethal storm ever to hit, ever, ever to hit the panhandle. And, of course, this time of year, it is hurricane season, particularly deadly because uh, the waters of the Gulf are so warm this time of year that that just picks up. They pick up more moisture, more moisture. It means a a stronger storm and much heavier rainfall in areas that have already uh, experienced a lot of it. Due to Hurricane Florence, Governor Rick Scott of Florida telling people in the storm surge, as authorities always do, um, just get out of the way. Water will come miles inshore and could easily rise over the roofs of houses. Okay, so... You're not going to survive storm surge. If you're in the, in the middle of storm surge, you're not going to survive. Not going to survive. Uh, NOAA, the uh, uh, really are, that holds the weather bureau under under NOAA, they're the ones in charge of uh, storm conditions. Uh, Rich Richard Henning, a meteorologist for NOAA, echoes the same warning with maybe a little more emphasis and some scientific back backup. I would really beg those people to listen to what emergency management folks are telling them. If they live in a storm surge prone area, this is the time to leave because this is not a storm to try to ride out. We're talking about a very, very large storm surge. And additionally, there's going to be a lot of damage inland probably from this storm because of the very high winds. So message is very, very clear if you're in that area. Please, please uh, follow the word of the authorities. Uh, Don't take a chance and evacuate. 
But, of course, you always have some nuts, some crazies, who will decide to stay uh, to stay and pray. Here's a man down in Apalachicola. Yeah, nice job. You Apalachicola? You got it. God, you got it. Man, it's all good. There he is. We have no idea what's really coming. Uh, some of us stayed, some of us left. Uh, and the ones who stayed, we just uh, we kind of pray that everything's going to be all right. Oh yeah, that's going to help. Mm, yeah, idiot. you know the thing with the thing with hurricanes it's, that's so wild is they have a tendency. You have plenty of time to plan for them, right? We saw this with Florence. Yeah. the Florence yeah. thing yeah. it seemed to last like two weeks, and a lot of people left. Some people stayed. <clears throat> Turned out to be a big problem for certain parts of the country, but not nearly as big of a problem. Board as, up your house and your business, and then get in the car. <laughs> Sure, sure. Well, I mean, look, yes, get out of the way. Get out of the way if you can do it. Uh, but the thing about this storm particularly is so unpredictable. You know, it was two days ago that it was just a tropical storm, yeah, and they were predicting yeah. it'll be, you know, a, a strong Category <laughs> 2 by the time that it gets to But to it's land. bumping up. It's a, it's a Category yeah. 4. It's yeah. already a Category 4, right? and it's <laughs> flying. It's moving very fast. It's gotten stronger and stronger, so... We'll keep our eye on that uh, uh, throughout the program and, of course, I'll bring you up to date tomorrow, too. Uh, meanwhile, a little surprise, Donald Trump tweeting out yesterday, big announcement uh, in the uh, Oval Office about 1030 with uh, Nikki Haley, big personnel announcement. Nobody exactly knew what that was all about. Uh, it turns out uh, Nikki Haley uh, was uh, the, the, had told the president that she, a couple of months ago, reportedly, that she wasn't planning on staying around that long. Uh, and then she called him the day before yesterday and said, uh, I want to make it, I'm, I'm make it official, make my announcement, resigning as a secretary, as ambassador, our ambassador to the United Nations. Nikki Haley, by the way, um, let's be clear. First of all, everything is, um, you know, <laughs> you, you got to put it in context, right? Um, so... Nikki Haley was one of the saner voices around Donald Trump, but I wouldn't call her a reasonable voice around Donald Trump. I mean, she's a real conservative. She supported Donald Trump's America First agenda all the way. Uh, once he won the primary, she was totally in, in support of Donald Trump in 2016 as well. She was an enabler. She was an enabler, yeah. totally. But all the things that Donald Trump has done to piss off uh, other Every, almost every other nation on the planet, uh, Nikki Haley has gone right along with. I mean, she supported his moving our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem when most people, everybody except Bibi Netanyahu, told him it was a bad idea. Um, she supported cutting off any funding for the Palestinians, so now we're just there as a friend of Israel and no longer the honest broker uh, in, in, in the Middle East. Um, she supported and still believes that he is has succeeded in um, bringing about the re the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. When in fact Kim Jong Un may say he loves Donald Trump, but he's done nothing about getting rid of his nuclear weapons. It's all a big it's all a big farce. Uh, so um, and, and by the way, Donald Trump withdrew from the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, and Nikki Haley supported that. So she's a total Trumper, total enabler. Um, it's just that she's a little more reasonable, if you will, than John Bolton, maybe not as ready to run for war. Uh, what's she going to do next? Nikki Haley says, first of all, the big question is, why did you quit now? Uh, she has no answer to that. She, all, all she can say is, there's no real reason. There's no personal reasons. I think that it's just very important for government officials to understand when it's time to step aside. It was very cryptic. It very cryptic. At least she didn't say, I'm going to spend more time with my family. I was going to say, like, yeah. I, I then, expected that, yeah. right? But they, Then they people would have laughed her out of the room. Uh, <laughs> but so, so then the, um, she thought she had to say nice things about Donald Trump, how much she loved working for him, and not only Donald Trump, but the whole first family get ready to throw up. The first lady has been nothing but very, very kind to me. Um, I can't say enough good things about Jared and Ivanka. Jared is such a hidden genius that no one understands. <laughs> oh, I mean, to redo God. the NAFTA deal the way he did. Yeah, right. What? Mm, right. The NAFTA deal, which is a big nothing burger, right? And, of course, nothing changed because... 
the Congress has to do it, and the Congress won't do anything this year. At any rate, that was a little gratuitous. Then the question comes up right away. Two, two questions. First of all, what is she going to do? Is she going to run in 2020? No, I'm not running for 2020. I can promise you what I'll be doing is campaigning for this one. So I look forward to supporting the president. Ha-ha. There was actually talk that she might run for president in 2020. Yeah, sure. Uh, and there's talk that she might run for Senate in 2020, but uh, Lindsey Graham, is, I think he's taking care of that, man. He's playing golf with the president every chance he can. Uh, and after his big speech at the Senate Judiciary Committee, he wants to be the man in 2020. You know, we Who talked knows? a lot about Lindsey Graham and how he's completely come over to Team Trump. I mean, com- completely, right? Oh, there's no yeah, independence yeah, left. Yeah, no. And we always wonder, like, what is that all about? It can't, maybe this is part of it. Maybe this is part of it. He feels like he's got to get Trump's backing in case Nikki Haley yeah. was to run. This could be part of it. I mean, there's no doubt he knows he's up in 2020, and yeah. he knows there are people who would who would take him on if he were a critic of Donald Trump, and he had to be sure that uh, he put that on. So, by the way, I did a little count yesterday um, with the help of um, Axios. Uh, Nikki Haley is hardly the first uh, of the top people around Donald Trump to walk away. Um, by my count, there are, and uh, again, with the help of Axios, 29. 29. Is that, is that how high it is? Top, top aides. Donald Trump, cabinet members or top White House aides who have left in the last roughly 18 months. 29. You remember, you'll remember a lot of these names. I'm just going to run through them. Michael That's Flynn, so many. Michael Flynn, Sally Yates, Sean Spicer, Reince Priebus, Anthony Scaramucci, Steve Bannon, Katie Walsh, Michael Dubke, Sebastian Gorka, KT McFarlane, Tom Price, Omarosa, James Comey, Andy McCabe, Dina Powell, Walter Schaub, Angela Reed, Rob Porter, Josh Raffle, Hope Hicks, Gary Cohn, John McAtee, Rex Tillerson, H.R. McMaster, David Shulkin, Michael Anton, Tom Bossert, Scott Pruitt, Nikki Haley. Good 29. Right now. So there are 23 cabinet members, right? <laughs> Donald Trump basically has wiped out an entire cabinet and more <laughs> in less than a year. It just less shows. Than two years. It, less than two years. It just shows what disarray the White House is in, what total chaos the White House is in. And what a lousy governor, gov- person who does, doesn't know how to govern, I guess is what I'm saying. And also how impossible it must be to work for him. So there's all, there's a big backstory about Nikki Haley that we don't know. You know, it's very interesting. I can't interesting. wait to find out. There are a couple of people in South Carolina politics that know her well, uh, including Mark Sanford, uh, who came oh, yeah. out yesterday and said, uh, something stinks. Yeah. This yeah. is, something's up. Um, this is not, nor- like. She's got some other plans that she's not she's not showing her hand yet. Yeah, something's gone here. Uh, so, by the way, the other question then. So, uh, wh- why, why did she leave? The other second question is, who would take her place? Well, uh, interesting. The speculation fueled by none other than Donald Trump himself is, why not Ivanka? Donald Trump was asked about that when he was getting out to, going out to uh, Air Force um, Marine One on his way to Iowa yesterday, uh, and he says Ivanka would be perfect. I think Ivanka would be incredible. That doesn't mean I'd, you know, I'd, I'd pick her because you'd be accused of nepotism. Even though I'm not sure there's anybody more competent in the world, but that's okay. No, there's nobody more competent in the entire world than my daughter Ivanka. Think about that statement for a second. Think about there's nobody more qualified in the entire world than Ivanka Trump, who is best known for her being. Famous. Yeah, her fashion She's, line. Yeah, right. Being right. a co-host no. on The Apprentice. She's proven to be just a total empty shell at the White House, as has Jared. But at any rate, you oh, mentioned— you mean the genius, Jared. Kushner. Oh, the genius, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Mark Sanford, former governor of South Carolina, form, soon to be former congressman from South Carolina, who was asked by J- Jake Tapper yesterday. His reaction was interesting— so what do you think about Ivanka, says Jake Tapper. Um, but what, 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 what did you make uh, uh, of him basically saying there's no one that would be better at the job than my daughter? Are you kidding me? 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> I like that honest reaction. Are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, And as for um, Donald Trump himself, as I mentioned, he hopped on Marine One. Uh, another campaign rally. Um, <laughs> we talked yesterday about the fact that the Democrats are starting the Democratic debates next spring. And uh, how crazy this is because it just means that the presidential campaign is going to be longer than ever before if they start the debates in the Demo- for the Democratic primary next spring. What the hell? Donald Trump started campaigning for president last year. And now it's uh, – these, these are not rallies to support candidates around the country. These are rallies. Donald Trump's basic message in, in all of these rallies is vote for me in 2020 – uh, and particularly because every day, every one of these rallies, he gets more and more over the top in his description and, and, and denunciation of the uh, Democratic Party. Now he says basically all the Democratic Party wants to do is uh, turn the government over, turn the country over to MS-13 gangs. They want right. to turn America, <laughs> these Democrats, and that's what they want, into a giant sanctuary for criminal aliens and the MS-13 killers. Yeah, that's why we're right. Just listen to anything that uh, anybody, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, it's all they talk about is we're here to support MS-13 gangs. Yes, that's our strategy. I mean, does anybody, does anybody seriously take, the, I take this guy seriously anymore? I can't believe anybody does. But when you see those crowds that they happen to pack into the rallies, the stadiums, wherever he goes, or these arenas. There are sadly uh, too many people out there. Meanwhile, you know, in the I want to talk a little bit about, uh, and let's talk a little bit about post Kavanaugh politics. By my count, I think we now are 27 days from the midterms. And I know that a lot of Democrats are worried that. Um, Things may not go so well in the midterms. Now, I'm not here to tell you everything's in the bag. But I am here to tell you, don't get discouraged. Just the opposite. Get busy. Get, as I said yesterday, get mad, get even. Remember in November. And that means every one of us has got to do everything we can between now and the midterms to make sure that we succeed in taking back the House and taking back the Senate and taking back as many governorships as we can and things that are looking really good in that area and as many state legislative seats as we can. And here's why I'm feeling very hopeful. The headline in Politico yesterday, our good friend Stephen Shepard, he'll be coming in maybe next week to tell, to bring us up to date on the midterms. The headline in Politico yesterday was, quote, the GOP House is crumbling. The GOP House is crumbling. So Politico looked at, across the board, uh, House seats. So here, here's, the, here's the landscape here. Here's why things look good for Democrats. There are, you need 218 to control the House, okay? There are two, today, 209 congressional seats that are firmly or leaning Democratic. That's only nine short of what they need. Among the others, there are 68 seats now held by Republicans. 68 seats now held by Republicans in play, meaning Democrats could pick those up. They're not going to get them all, but 68 in play. How many Democratic seats held by Democrats in play? Six. Six versus 68. So you see where the opportunities are. Washington Post yesterday, here's a second factor, a little indicator. Washington Post looked at the, they say, the key 69 uh, house seats across the country, all over the country, 69 of them they identified. Um, Most of those are held by Republicans, and they they went through there and asked people, okay, who do you want to take over the Congress? Who are you going to vote for? Democrat or Republican, Democrats, 50, Republicans, 
46. Third thing to consider, uh, these, these are the midterms. In the midterm elections, most of the time, particularly the first midterms, as we learned with Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and almost every other president, the president's first midterms, president usually loses about 40 seats to the other party. Uh, now, for example, um, for presidents whose approval rating is less than 50%, they lose an average of 36 seats. Democrats have to win this year 23 seats. That's a lot. That's a lot of seats still, but not impossible. Republicans won 63 seats in 2010 when President Obama's rating was below 50 at 45%. Okay, Now factor in, Donald Trump's approval rating today is 41%. So just if the averages hold out for seats lost, Democrats should pick up about 35 or 40. They need 23. And one final factor I want to tell you about another good sign, the money is flowing in. As reported by Axios yesterday, and where's the money flowing in? On the Democratic side. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee raised $400,000 in emails after Christine Blasey Ford testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. People heard that testimony. They said, we got to put Democrats back in control of the House. Kamala Harris put out an email, I got this email, asking people to send money to Heidi Heitkamp after she voted against Kavanaugh. In 24 hours, $400,000 came in for Heidi Heitkamp, thanks to Kamala Harris. People are responding. Act Blue, I mentioned uh, that um, Carol and I, the day before yesterday, we sat down, we made a list of 10 candidates, two for governor, four for Senate, four for the House, that we thought might need a little extra help. And we went to Act Blue. That's a big online fundraising platform that's raising money for Democrats. They've raised over a billion dollars for Democrats this cycle. And we made, we sent 10 checks, 10 contributions, if you will, through Act Blue to 10 different candidates. Okay, in response to Brett Kavanaugh, on October 5, Act Blue raised one day. $10 million to support Democrats across the board. And on October 6, another $9 million. So the energy is there. The money is there. The support is there. The opportunity is there. And Axios quoted one Republican strategist. This was uh, our good friend, Ax uh, Alexi McCammon, who reported this. One Republican strategist who told her, quote, yes, Kavanaugh is animating white, college-educated women. But guess what? They weren't voting for a Republican a month ago, and they're still not voting for a Republican. So the energy there, the momentum is there, the opportunity is there. And again, the only thing that's missing, uh, well, I'm not sure it's missing, but the only thing needed is our will to make it happen and our contribution to make it happen, contribution in whatever way we can making sure our friends are registered, making sure we all get out to vote, uh, take, taking time to make phone calls, to walk precincts, picking up the, going online or picking up the phone or get, putting a check in the mail, uh, whatever level contribution you can take, even five bucks, uh, enough $5 contributions, as Bernie Sanders pointed out, uh, can help win some of these races. So we've got to do every, every one of us, everything we can between now and the midterm uh, elections. You know, this is really shaping up to be. It's shaping a, up a historic election. And one, one little, one very important seat that's been held by Republicans. Just one little example held by Republicans a long, long time. It's right across the river. It's Virginia Ten. It's now held by Barbara Comstock. She was elected two years ago. Uh, she's a Trumper. She's a total Trumper. She and uh, she is behind twelve points to Democrat Jennifer Wexton. That's crazy. And in the, so the uh, Washington Post front page story this morning, and when they asked the people in that district, why? Why are you turning against Barbara Comstock? Why is this district turning blue? 
the number one reason is Donald Trump. And the Trump, Donald Trump. Yeah, the Trump issue is and bigger I, than anything else that Republicans can throw at any Democrat. Right. right? I mentioned like, I mentioned those sixty nine districts that the Post looked at yesterday. Nice. The number one issue, Donald Trump. Yeah. So these Republicans that cling to Donald Trump, that support Donald Trump, uh, that have basically abandoned their party and joined the Trump party, I, I hope they all get crushed. Yeah. Totally. Serves them right. Totally. Serves them right. And yeah. you look at you look at like some of these attack ads of. You know, oh, this Democrat would spend too much. Well, Donald Trump spends way too much. I mean, you look at the tax cuts. Like, that's crazy. No, anything Every used, single thing. Anything they used to believe in, yeah. they no longer it's believe gone. in. Yeah. It's gone. Right. So none of their attacks are sticking. Yeah. So here's my Here's my don't despair. Just get to work, dude. Get to work, dude and dudesses. Yes. Remember in November. All right. By the way, there is one other factor in these midterms that uh, we haven't talked a lot about, and that is... You know, if they did it in 2016, there's a lot of hacking going on by the Russians, maybe even the Chinese. Olivia Beavers is a cybersecurity reporter at The Hill. We wanted to look into the reality of that, and we will with uh, Olivia Beavers when we come right back here on The Bill Press Show, Wednesday, October 10. Take The Bill Press Show anywhere you go. Download our free podcast, search for The Bill Press Show on iTunes, and catch the highlights from every show. Son, we got to talk about... What's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning. Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you eat stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. OK, but remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He really likes to be around people. And as soon as I start to make my breakfast, Hamilton is right there. I get out my mat and I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I mean, look at this little face. How could you not love him?
Download our podcast, search for The Bill Press Show on iTunes, and remember to rate, review, and subscribe. This is The Bill Press Show. You bet it is. Uh, This is Wednesday, October 10. Uh, Welcome back, everybody, to The Bill Press Show, live from our nation's capital. And our studio right here on Capitol Hill, where we're brought to you today by the um, International Association of Iron Workers, the great men and women of the Iron Workers Union. Under President Eric Dean, they are building America's communities today and ready to rebuild America's infrastructure tomorrow. Yeah, that's if the Congress ever gets its act together on an infrastructure bill. Check out their website at ironworkers.org. We salute them. Thank them for the support of the program. Also wanted to remind you, there is a great news site to keep you up to date on progressive news uh, and progressive media. We call it the one-stop shop for progressive news uh, leading up to the midterms. It's a new website called leftisright.com, and you can get there by downloading the app PVN, Political Voices Network, uh, and there that will lead you directly to Three great shows, if I must say so myself, The Bill Press Show, The Stephanie Miller Show, and The Tom Hartman Show, right back-to-back, only available on leftisright.com. Download the app at PVN, Progressive Voices Network. doesn't cost you anything. It's free. So do it now and uh, join me, Stephanie, and Tom uh, every day. And we welcome today to the studio, Olivia Beavers is the cybersecurity reporter and does a lot of general all-around reporting, too at the Great Hill newspaper, for which I am a columnist as well. Olivia, it's good to see you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, We've been at it for a little bit here, so we wanted to catch up with some comments before we start. Yes, indeed. We're on Twitter, at BP Show, at BP Show. Lots of people have commented on Nikki Haley's resigning. Uh, We appreciate all those comments. I'll just read one here from Brent McDonald, who makes it pretty clear. Uh, After the midterms, Trump is going to fire Jeff Sessions. Lindsey Graham, who continues to audition for the job, will get appointed as attorney general. Republican governor of South Carolina puts Nikki Haley in the Senate seat. That is a couple of people have made that comment, right? Like if Lindsey Graham does become attorney general, that's going to be an open Senate seat in South Carolina. Nikki Haley could be positioning herself for a 2024 run. Bingo. Yeah, I think that's what's going on here, right? Yeah. Or uh, she could be appointed by sure, sure by the governor. Well, yeah, she could get appointed, but I mean, I meant run for president in twenty twenty four. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, also, somebody pointed out KG sent us an article uh, that Nikki Haley is leaving the UN amb- UN ambassador's office with up to one million dollars in debt. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. I don't know. That was reported yesterday as well. Apparently, um, that but. You know, she's been in politics, but not a wealthy person, which yeah. is unusual these days. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and on the midterms, uh, someone comments again on Twitter at BP Show. <laughs> do not think that Trump won't do something to prevent the midterms from happening, the midterm blue wave from happening. They aren't going to let defeat just happen. Do you have a comment on any topic at any time? You can find us on Twitter at BP Show, at BP Show. And I would say we are not going to let that happen. There you go. <laughs> So, uh, Olivia, there is, um, I remember, I keep coming back to when President Obama was elected, and I think the first interview that he gave, I believe, was to John Harwood, who then was with CNBC, perhaps, maybe still is, a good reporter, maybe it was with the Wall Street Journal then. At any rate, John Harwood asked him a question, what keeps you awake at night? And I was stunned when he said cybersecurity, (laughs) without hesitating. Cybersecurity. And I thought, what? Nobody talks about that. But now we hear more and more about it. Uh, and we still haven't dealt with the cybersecurity problems and the hacking, particularly, and the interference in the 2016 election. Um, it, it, should we just take for granted that somebody, the Russians or maybe the Chinese, are doing it in the midterms? So. We have what not, do we know? We have not seen activity from the Russians yet, but that doesn't mean we won't see it. And we have seen steps from Russia or Iran to continue these disinformation campaigns on social media. Facebook came out, uh, Facebook and Microsoft both announced that they had detected these uh, disinformation campaigns. So even if they aren't going after um, election machines and systems, they might still be trying to so discord in the country 
and we're we're approaching that time where we might start having news come out that they are uh, looking to meddle in the election, but Russia and uh, Iran. Uh, there were there was a disinformation campaign um, detected about uh, Iran, and what that sort of uh, I talked to some national security experts, and they said this could be Iran seeing that Russia had had successfully sowed discord. And then Iran decides to do it as well. So right. they, they took a page out of their playbook. Right. Well, this is exactly what they were doing in 2016, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So um, put on both sides of an issue, they, as you pointed out, you, the phrase you used, just trying to sow discord, mm -hmm. uh, picking key issues and in key areas of the country where those issues would play uh, and getting people you to know, be, become angry yeah. and, uh, and, and in, to vote or not vote, I guess. In a country where we have so many different political views and opinions, it's, it's easy to seize on something that's going on. Kavanaugh would be something that could be easily further inflamed if, if uh, a foreign actor said, look what's going on in that country. All you have to do is uh, start pushing. Uh, U.S. does not believe sexual assault um, claims or... Uh, women want to throw men in jail for false claims. You know, if they if they went on either side of those, they could really inflame the issue. Right now, they were doing it on Facebook and what other platforms? Uh, there, I believe that they they found some on Twitter too. Uh, Facebook came out and said that they had found them, took down the pages, and then Twitter went and removed them as well. So, what filters have been put in place since 2016 to prevent this? Well, any? Well, Facebook has said that they have hired a group to try to be able to uh, distill what is being perpetuated, uh, being pushed by bots or fake accounts. And we're finding that they are becoming better and more open about what they're finding. But it's hard. It's hard to say this is a fake account, this is a bot, and this is fake news. And so what they do is they look for something that doesn't make sense, and that's not always just uh, Facebook. That's cybersecurity firms saying, why is uh, this one account pushing pro-Iranian views um, when it's supposed to be based off of a college group? That doesn't fully add up. Let's check this out. But right now, the entire the, the responsibility for preventing this is entirely in the hands of these um, – Inter big internet companies? It's largely uh, in their hands. Uh, what we have seen is I mean, private. There's, a, there, there, there's an acronym for those companies, right? Uh, three, like three initials or something for Facebook, Twitter, and. <laughs> no, no. The, but I, I, I saw it once. I was reading an article. I didn't know what it meant. And I looked it up, and it was sort of like it's, uh, it's not like big internet companies, but big internet providers or something. I call them and, the tech giants. The tech giants. Uh, yeah. All right, that's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> so the responsibility is entirely in the hands of the tech giants it, it, and their cybersecurity teams? It's largely been their job to show that they can uh, combat the problem. And and you saw some of the top executives from these tech giants come and testify, and I think right, they're trying right. to avoid <laughs> regulations. Um, but... Uh, what we are also seeing is some cybersecurity firms who have found that they can put themselves in the middle of it and saying, hey, we found this disinformation campaign. We let Facebook know, and it led to 600 fake accounts. Um, so you are seeing outside groups coming in and saying this isn't right. Uh, are they working for the big tech giants? or No, but they. I do think that business-wise it helps them get a headline and a bigger profile um, and it, it boosts the reputation in the cyber realm. Right. All right. So we're talking, you, you mentioned Russia and Iran. Um, there's also been some talk of the Chinese. Any, and we've seen evidence of them before mm -hmm. hacking into uh, like the Defense Department yes. and other government agencies. Uh, any evidence of the Chinese involved in this election cycle? So uh, there has not as far as I'm, I've, I'm aware. But, you know, recently the Trump administration started to come out and say, um, why are we looking at Russia? The Chinese are the real threat. Look at China. And this has been something he's been saying for a while. But he he said that there were... Um, Who was saying this? I'm sorry. I, the president recently said that they were actively um, seeking to meddle. 
and Vice President Mike Pence came out and said they were a bigger threat than Russia. And we haven't seen that much information come from the Trump administration, but China has been active in cyber means. Um, it, one thing that we talk about when we talk about cyber is that there's a threshold. So what is the threshold where the U.S. can can point their finger and say, hey, don't do that? And what is the threshold where we take it even further and we slap really painful sanctions against that country? And and just to, to, to clarify one thing, mm -hmm. when we're talking about Russia or Iran or China, we're not talking about Russians or Iranians or Chinese individuals so much as we're really talking about the governments of these countries, correct? Right, or hacking groups that are sponsored by these governments. Hacking groups sponsored by the mm -hmm. governments who are directed to do this. Yes. They're individuals who are carrying them out, but yes. the direction comes from, from the top. Yes, and cybersecurity firms have been trying to attribute when they're connected to a government because it's really important for our national security awareness. Uh, and how much of this is the United States doing to, our, to other countries? That is a little bit less reported, so I don't. I don't <laughs> you bet it is. <laughs> that yeah. that I don't have as much knowledge about, but um, if they're up to it, is there any doubt that the NSA, for example, is mm -hmm. up to it in other countries and other elections? There, uh, there could be. Um, it's it's something that sometimes in cyber, the more sophisticated you are the harder it is to say this is who it is and blame it. And you can also put code in to make, if it's Russians, they can put code in to say, oh, this was North Korea, mm -hmm. and try to wipe away the tracks. And the U.S. is very sophisticated in cyber. And one thing that we point out is so are the Russians. And with the DNC hack, you had a cybersecurity firm, FireEye, say, if the Russians didn't want to be found in this hack, we wouldn't have been able to detect them. But they kind of made it uh, clear about their involvement. They they didn't hide it like they could have. Wow. Um, so the this is so so complex. In the meantime, um, what has the Congress done uh, about this at all? Well, so um, there was one bill that really looked like it was likely to pass, which um, was. An election security bill put forward. It was had bipartisan support by Klobuchar and Senator Lankford. But at the last minute, some Republicans and possibly opposition from the White House started to raise issue with it. So what had looked like a lot of momentum um, about improving uh, the security of election systems and giving more money to, to states and election localities uh, suddenly got halted. And the U.S., after the 2016 cyber attacks uh, and, and all that we went through with Russia, we didn't pass a bill. So even though we have put bills forward and they have moved in Congress, nothing came through, which is, is pretty um, crazy, yeah. I guess. And a lot of national security uh, lawmakers or cyber lawmakers expressed profound disappointment in that. But it, it is stunning that here we are two years after which was which was basically an act of war, I think a different kind of war, on our on the very fundamentals of our democracy and the United States Congress uh, has done nothing about it. But you remind me that there are really two levels we're talking about, aren't there? I mean, there is the propaganda level, if you will, mm -hmm. of um, putting these um, Inflaming people over certain issues and putting this stuff up on Facebook and, and Google or Twitter or yep. whatever uh, to confuse people. But then there's also the hacking into the election system, like the election process, the mm -hmm. election machine to influence the actual vote count, mm -hmm. right? So we've talked about the propaganda side. What evidence do we have that there is actually at the county level or the city level or whatever level the voting apparatus? that they were able to infiltrate that or attempt it? So uh, there were 21 states that had their election systems hacked by the Russians and some 
uh, officials from the Department of Homeland Security said it could have been more, but this is the 21. And what were they the doing? Were they like just uh, wiping out votes or changing so votes? So they didn't or? change. Um, the officials have maintained that no votes have been changed, and that is a line that has been used by both Democrats and Republicans on the Senate Intelligence Committee. So they didn't go in and, you know, I voted for Hillary Clinton, and they turned my vote no. into a vote for Trump. No, but, um, you know, I'm curious whether there was an appetite to do that. Uh, election systems, uh, there will be the secretaries of state will say, hey, they're a lot harder to hack. But then you have some cybersecurity experts who have – who guide an 11 year old to hacking the machines in certain states um, or going on to Florida's election website and meddling in, in that sort of information. Um, but I mean, there, there but, are vulnerabilities. But what is their impact? I mean, they could uh, th uh, they could they, actually uh, a state or a city that or a precinct that might have gone again for Hillary. Could they turn it again to, to I, into I, a Trump victory or that, no I don't think that's the greatest fear I think the greatest fear is that they can undermine faith and so people will say hey if my vote could be um, is at risk if these systems are at risk what's why should I even vote and that is the fear <laughs> is if they can undermine the faith in the election system then they can um, you know hurt voter turnout um, I don't know whether you had a chance to read it, but Jane Mayer, who I think one of the greatest and best, best investigative reporters in the country, uh, had a piece two weeks ago in the New Yorker magazine where she shows – there's a new book out by Kathleen Jameson from the, um, uh, the, oh, the school of uh, – the University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. School of Journalism. Um, I forget the name of the title of the book, but Jane Mayer writes a writes interviewed her writes about her book where she says conclus conclusively that not only did the russians hack into our election system in 2016 but they did in fact influence the outcome of the election that that, that there's no doubt that they helped that they did materially help donald trump win the election you know before it was always saying mm -hmm. well they hacked in our intelligence agencies 17 of them said yes we know they hacked in we want, we make no conclusion about whether or not they influence the outcome of the election. Mm -hmm. I think Jay Mayer's article, thanks to Kathleen Jameson, conclusive, conclusively proves just the opposite. They did help elect Donald Trump. Well, so I don't know whether you saw that article or I have not any. seen the article, but um, there. Got to go back and read it. It is. I will. Powerful. I will check that out. There's, um, there's debate about whether the disinformation campaigns put. Donald Trump into the Oval Office and hindered Hillary Clinton's campaign because it's really hard to perfectly and precisely measure how much something that you read online influences your beliefs. And, you know, I do think if you, like marketing, if you see something again and again, the odds of your opinion being shaped by that are more likely. But did that change how you're going to vote? I've seen back and forth about that. Yeah. Uh, Got to read this article. I, okay. I don't remember all the details of it, but she has some pretty solid evidence that, in fact, and and by the way, it makes sense because more and more people get their information today, you know, not from radio, mm -hmm. not from television, not from print, God knows, yes. but online. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it does influence their thinking and influences their their voting. Now there is a new agency that's been set up. Mm -hmm. In where DHS the Department, Department of Homeland of, Security yes has set up a um, it's basically elevated an agency it used to have this long name um, called uh, MPPD it's it's a mouthful and I won't even just yeah. in case I get it wrong I won't even start to to say yeah. it on it on Typical here Washington alphabet soup but uh, DHS had a it was a bipartisan um, effort to get their name changed to say this is a cybersecurity office within DHS. Um, we will be this is our mission because for a long time they said um, different states or authorities didn't know to call them and say, hey, we're seeing this unusual cyber activity. So recently the Senate uh, hotlined a, a, a vote on the bill. Uh, and it did pass uh, by unanimous consent, but there have been some changes to the bill, so now it has to go back to the House. So whereas it, it might have had a chance of making it through before the election, it still 
needs a little bit more of a push before it's it's enacted. Well, it sounds to me like what you're telling us is that we're going into the uh, midterm elections of 2018, and um, some people are already making moves toward 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump was at a campaign rally last night, you know. Cory Booker is in New Hampshire. Kamala Harris <laughs> is in Iowa. Uh, there's no secret. Michael Bloomberg announced today that he is re-registering as a Democrat, and we all know why. Mm -hmm. So we're in the middle of the 2018, on the threshold of the 2018 midterms, and already starting making moves toward 2020, and um, we're really still not doing anything about the threat of cybersecurity on our election system. So I, I like to think that if you remember climate change, it was hard at times to garner enough attention to it because we're still the, not doing the, any, the enemy we're still not doing anything about it <laughs> right the enemy of climate change doesn't have a face it's not something that we can run after with a stake and say or with, with a knife and say hey stop what you're doing uh similar to cybersecurity, when you think of it i think a picture of a computer pops up and if people had more awareness of what was going on too about uh just cyber hygiene mm -hmm. um it might also be taken more seriously in Congress. Uh, there's only a select few lawmakers that I go talk to for cybersecurity stories because those are the ones who seem to have the knowledge and understanding. But I do think that there is going to be maybe this major cyber attack sometime in the future, uh, maybe against critical infrastructure, uh, but something that finally gets us moving and makes cybersecurity a much more present threat. Uh, I think that's now. a good point. By the way, the only person that we've had, Peter, I think, in in who seems to know anything about cybersecurity is Ro Khanna, <laughs> Congressman Ro Khanna, yes. who represents Silicon Valley. Yes. And mm -hmm. one would hope that he would, <laughs> and he does. He does. He does have some. But who cyber else in Congress is up to speed on it? Who uh, do you who do you depend on? Michael McCall uh, from Texas. He's a Republican lawmaker who is uh, head of the House Homeland Security Committee. John Ratcliffe, who is also um, a big cyber, he's a Republican uh, lawmaker, also from Texas. Um, and then Jim Langevin, who is a Democratic from uh, Rhode Island. From Rhode yeah. Island. And then on the Senate side, you have Mark Warner and uh, uh, James Langford and Klobuchar are, are the three that I really tend to go and ask, hey, what's going on? Uh, and some of the others, I'm sure, wouldn't know how to send an email. <laughs> I bet Arn Hatch doesn't know how to send an email. <laughs> well, I wouldn't take that bet. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Don't you, right? Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, that's a little tangent there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you may be right. Uh, it, with all this talk about cybersecurity, if you're talking about election systems, it may be hard to – it may take an attack on the electric grid, mm -hmm. right, shutting down – or the phone system, right, or transportation systems or something like that before people finally say, hey, this is really a new kind of warfare. This is really a threat that we've got to do something about. Very fascinating field. Um, Olivia, nice to see you. Thanks nice for coming in. We love The Hill uh, and check it out every day. We got uh, Kate Martell from The Hill coming up a little bit later too. It's thehill.com. Stay tuned. Nikki Schwab joins us next from New York Post as a friend of Bill. This is the Bill Press Show.
giving you everything you need to fight the Trump administration. This is The Bill Press Show, live at youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show. Hurricane Michael, now a Category 4, moving fast toward the Gulf Coast. Watch out and get out. Hey, what do you say, everybody? On a Wednesday, October 10, here we go, The Bill Press Show. Great to see you today. Hello, hello, hello from our studio on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Joining you all across this great land of ours with the news of the day and look forward to hearing from you, your comments about uh, what you're here, what you see, uh, what you think about it all. Send us your comments on Twitter at BP Show. Of course, uh, our eyes, the eyes of the entire nation on the Gulf Coast of Florida, uh, where the maybe, if it continues at this level, the worst storm ever to hit the Gulf Coast would be Michael, Hurricane Michael due to slam into uh, the Panama City area about 2 o'clock this afternoon. We're also keeping our eye on a big development yesterday, a surprise development here in Washington, D.C., with the uh, sudden resignation, apparently, of our United Nations, our uh, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Nikki Schwab, a different Nikki, Nikki Schwab. The other Washington Nikki. That's it. <laughs> Covers the White House of, of Washington in general for the New York Post uh, and joins us in studio for the next hour as a friend of Bill. It's always good to see you, Nikki. It's that so good to see you as well. Coming in. Lots of a big surprise yesterday, huh? I yeah. was very shocked yeah. because it seemed like things were, were going really well. Obviously, she's a rising right. star in the Republican Party. Yeah. The timing is, is extremely odd because it's, you know, a couple of weeks shy of the midterm elections. Yeah. And then you had her sort of denying that she was up to anything in 2020, which has always sort of so, been the speculation that right. if she were to sort of drop out, leave the yeah. Trump administration now, it was for political reasons, is that right. she was going to jump in, she was going to, you know, vie for the Republican nomination in, uh, you know, in, in about a year. Yeah. Okay, so we'll catch up with uh, Nikki Haley and a whole lot more on the political front uh, and the news front with uh, Nikki Schwab and with all of you. Send us your comments on Twitter at BP Show. But first... Peter with the big headlines. The full court press. Oh, yeah. All the big stories making news. Every now and then, Bill, a story comes across my desk that is made for full court press. Here is one of them. A woman was removed from Frontier Airlines flight yesterday. Oh, she flight. had. Wait, a miniature horse. Close. Oh. Okay. The airline refused to let her fly with her emotional support animal, so they removed her from the flight. The flight was going from Orlando, Florida to Cleveland, Ohio. Because she was trying to fly with her emotional support. A boa constrictor. An emotional support squirrel. <laughs> she wanted to fly with her pet squirrel. That is her emotional support <laughs> animal. As you mentioned yes. earlier this week, there are, there are, they are loosening the rules on what you can and cannot fly with. But they say... <laughs> Rodents, including squirrels, are not allowed on flights. Beginning November 1st, in fact, Frontier will only allow dogs and cats on its flights nope. as emotional support. Really? All different no airlines. Horses? No No tiny horses. <laughs> different airlines have Alaska different airlines criteria. This year. Cats this week. Cats, at, uh, dogs, and Mini ponies. Mini horses. Yeah. Mini ponies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the passenger was told of the airline policy, and she refused to leave the plane. So the police were called. Everyone was forced to deplane, and she was escorted off with the emotional support squirrel. Can you imagine how much affection you get from a squirrel? Insane. <laughs> Insane. Oh, my God. God. What a crazy story. It is. Yeah. Uh, I, but I, first of all, I never thought of squirrels as rodents. They are. They're, they are exactly. Yeah. They're, they're like rats and mice and squirrels are rodents. With bushier rodents. tails. They're yeah. cuter than rats yeah, for sure, they but are. they are rodents. They are rodents. I don't want to think of them as rodents. <laughs> Well, I mean, they are cute. cute. Yeah. And some of them fly. I mean, I'm not saying she should have had the rodent on the plane, but okay. Yeah, it sounds like you're being a little too uh, enthusiastic in your support of this uh, of this squirrel. Uh, one quick story, by the way. Michael Bloomberg has registered yeah. as a Democrat. We'll talk about that, I'm sure. But <laughs> breaking news. Breaking He's running. News. He's running. <laughs>
This is the Bill Press Show. Yep. Nikki Haley says, take this job and shove it. Well, that's not exactly what she said. She said, thank you, Mr. President. But she said goodbye, nonetheless, uh, out by the end of the year, resigning, not being fired, resigning as our ambassador to the United Nations. What's that all about? Hello, everybody. We'll find out, maybe, uh, someday. (laughs) The big backstory there. It is the Bill Press Show on this Wednesday, October 10. So good to see you today. You're looking great, and uh, we love having you on board, uh, whether you're watching on uh, Free Speech TV, whether you're watching us online on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bill Press Show, or joining us in Chicago and out all over the greater Chicago area on WCPT. Thanks for being part of the program. Uh, and don't forget, send us your comments as we go along uh, at BP Show. We love, uh, love, love hearing from you. And also love welcoming to the studio. Uh, Here's a friend of Bill, good friend from the New York Post, Nikki Schwab. She's got it all covered. Uh, What do you think? Nikki, it's good to see you. Good to see you as well. So what do you think about Michael Bloomberg registering as a Democrat? I mean, it's pretty clear one only one reason he would do so right i mean i i joke that you know he's running but i think he i think he's definitely looking into it i he mean has said as much every democrat with even like a sliver of presidential ambitions is looking at it right now because there's no clear front runner i mean of course you know you can look at bernie sanders you can look at joe biden but beyond that i think that everybody thinks that they have a, a decent shot at winning the nomination so why not bloomberg and what, an interesting tidbit the new york times actually reported that i was trying to suss out but of course nobody would talk about is that senator chuck schumer is among those who is sort of uh, pushing bloomberg in that direction which is an interesting alliance because obviously uh, it looks like Senator Gillibrand, the other New York senator, also has potential White House amb- ambitions. Oh, for sure. So it'd be interesting to see Schumer sort of uh, line up with Bloomberg as opposed to Gillibrand. Wow. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard that. That is fa- that. I is mean, of course, nobody's talking about it. And so no, it's, it's no. just was literally a nugget in a New York Times column. But it, it would be a very interesting political alliance nonetheless. OK, so like you got to say. This is the year of the woman, for sure. I mean, this absolutely totally overtakes 1992 being the year of the woman. There's so many women running these days, and the and the women's movement, the Me Too movement particularly, is so strong, and such so many strong women running for Congress, for Senate, whatever. Yes. So it's the year of the woman. Uh, the Democratic Party is saying we need to, you know, we need to. Um, be more progressive, and we need younger people and fresh voices and everything. Why Michael Bloomberg? I mean, you mentioned Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden. Why another older white guy? And the, I mean, and that's the question because I I don't what know is, if he gets out of a Democratic primary, right? I mean, if I per, per, would be perhaps stunned if he gets out of a Democratic primary. I mean, I'm not saying anything bad about him. I like the fact, that particularly on guns. Yeah, he's been he's been strong. He puts his money where his mouth is. He just gave twenty million dollars to help elect Democrats around the country. Exactly. God, God bless him. I mean, he's a, but, he's a savvy moderate, but I don't know if that's what's going to be appealing for the Democratic base and, you know, the run up to 2020. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now, I think you're from New York, aren't you? I'm not from New York. I'm from Western Pennsylvania. Western Pennsylvania. But you. OK. New York. I just Post. I just I just work for the for New York <laughs> okay. papers. And my other correspondent is from Detroit, Michigan. So they've got oh. a bunch of Midwesterners <laughs> working for the New York Post, which is. Which is kind of great. We're you know we're Midwestern nice working yeah. for a tablet. So we'll see how far Michael Bloomberg goes, and um, you know, uh, but he certainly got the money to <laughs> to fund his own campaign. Absolutely. I mean, you got the you have the I, it, it would be the clash of the t- the clash of the two New York billionaires. Exactly, and I and I think also I mean he does attract you know the center, which I think is is sick of Trump. But again, that's not who wins a Democratic primary. I think right now, I think. You see yeah. a more progressive candidate sort of come out of that, you know, and it could be like a cast of like 20 people running for that nomination. Easy. Yeah. Easy 20. I could name you 20 like right now. Me too. At the time. All right. So um, yesterday at the White House, um, you know, let's 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 be honest. I mean, Nikki Haley is no lefty. Right. And she's a Trumper and she supported totally the Trump agenda. But she was still considered one of the more reasonable Sure. A voices around Donald Trump, unlike a John Bolton, right? And she and she had a backstory of being uh, of resisting Trump, and you know she put her money uh, behind Marco Rubio, 
you in, do recall in the primary in yep. the primary and, and sort of right. and had sort but of sassed, she, sassed she, about the strong voices in her party she did and then she came around but, right so so uh but it was still a surprise when she pulled the plug yesterday what why I don't think anyone knows. I think that there's a bigger story. Uh, one of the most interesting things I heard was out of uh, Mark Sanford, who's obviously a, a congressman from South Carolina. Well, I'm going to stop you right now, okay? Because, uh, uh, God, no, we'll, we'll get to that. But he, yes, he was on CNN yesterday, but tell the story first. But he, he was, you know, and he was a former governor, of, obviously, yeah. of the state, with the Argentinian mistress, blah, blah, blah. But he uh, please the Appalachian Trail. Yes, the Appalachian Trail, Sanford. Uh, but he he thought that you know uh, Crew, which is a you know Sunshine organization in town, they were looking into some of these flights that she had taken on private jets from businessmen that were friends of hers, and that's how she sort of excused it away on her filings. But uh, thought that she might be under investigation soon. So that was one hmm. thought as to why she was leaving. Another was just purely financial, that she needed to make money uh, before sort Apparently of— Apparently, you know, she and her husband have a lot of debt. They don't have, uh, they don't have a lot of money. And exactly. They, and they've got two, you know kids that, that need to go to college. Uh, so that was another sort of line of thinking. Um, uh, uh, but I think a lot of people were surprised because the, the politics doesn't quite make sense. If she's going to—she's really going to take her name out of the 2020 cycle of doing anything then you know why now why a couple of weeks before the midterms so she was asked yesterday there with the president of the oval office uh about the um chances that she might run in 2020 she made it she made it pretty clear um that that's not her intention here she is no no, I'm not running for 2020. I can promise you what I'll be doing is campaigning for this one. So I look forward to supporting the president. Da, 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 da. Okay. But, you know, uh, as Peter was saying earlier, or one of our uh, listeners actually tweeted it, if Lindsey Graham does yes. get appointed. That's the other theory. Attorney General. Who's a natural fit for that Senate seat? Total. And yeah. then, then who's on deck if Trump wins re-election in 2020? Who is on deck to potentially run in 2024 for the Republicans and now has Senate experience as well. You know, Nikki Haley is absolutely 100 percent going to make a run for president at yeah. some point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, she certainly is not walking away from the American political scene. No, no, no. So we'll we'll see her again on the national stage for sure. And I would have to think that she has some sort of knowledge of. Like, you know, either a Senate seat opening up because of, uh, you know, an appointment or something like that. I mean, she, she she's probably got a pretty clear course here. Of course, the, the thing is, she didn't have to resign to set herself up for that Senate yeah, seat either. So right. it still yeah. doesn't uh, totally solve the mystery. The other question is, who might take her place? And, um, of course, the issue, the, uh, the possibility <laughs> Of Ivanka comes up right away because she herself praised Ivanka and Jared yes. during the meeting. Yes. And then the president, on his way out to Marine One yesterday, was asked about, "Hey, are you going to name Ivanka?" Here's a uh, here's Donald Trump. I think Ivanka would be incredible. That doesn't mean I'd you, you know I'd, I'd pick her because you'd be accused of nepotism, even though I'm not sure there's anybody more confident in the world. But that's okay. Nobody more confident in, confident in the entire world than my little girl, Ivanka. Yeah, right. He mm -hmm. wouldn't do that, would he? She's already taken herself out of the running. Oh, yeah, but. <laughs> I mean, he, he might still not, do nothing it. would surprise me. I mean, I actually thought that maybe uh, he would, he would, you know, maybe uh, name Jared, and then they would get a chance to escape back to New York. So it, it would sort of work out perfectly for them. They really belong in New York. I mean, I just don't I, think that they're very happy here. I mean, you don't see them like socializing, you know, in and around Washington. I, I think that they thought that they could sort of come here and, and have the sort of life that they had in New York. Yeah. And, and I don't know if they go back to New York that they're going to have the life that they had there either, because obviously the politics have gotten so contentious. Yeah. I think that sort of their natural. I mean, one of their, you know, among their sort of larger group of friends was Chelsea Clinton. I mean, do you think that set of people is going to be like, hey, Javanka, come back and hang out? Uh, well, I've said this before at the risk of pissing off everybody in New York again. I will say it again. I think New York is shallow enough to take them back. Uh, <laughs> the Hamptons will welcome them, and they'll be, they'll be stars, just like all the rest of that phony glitter up there. But um, 
at, at any rate, this possibility now that now I want to come back to Mark Sanford. Um, this possibility, Mark Sanford was on um, with uh, Jake Tapper yesterday afternoon on CNN. So Tapper asked him about Ivanka. Um, but what 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 what, what did you make uh, uh, of him basically saying there's no one that would be better at the job than my daughter? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That's his response. <laughs> These, are you kidding me? These lawmakers that are leaving Congress, they, they're, they're, they're free to say whatever they want now. Yeah. It's great. Are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Those are great responses. Sanford unplugged. And obviously, and he knows her well, right? Yeah. So. Uh-huh. But, it, you know, one other factor, it um, it sort of uh, doesn't do much for the uh, her leaving for the uh, diversity quotient in the uh, oh. Trump administration in terms of people of color or women that was the first thing that uh, our dear um, Omarosa pointed out on Twitter when she heard that Nikki Haley was leaving mm. was like and there goes another woman of color at the door not to be replaced by a woman of color probably uh, I did a little with the help of um, uh, so uh, um, Frank Allen on Axios yesterday uh-huh. uh, with Jonathan Swan so I'll put out a list of 28 people that Nikki Haley becomes, according to them, the 28th. I added one, Sally Yates, they didn't have on their list. But <laughs> so, so here's a list of, these are 29 top White House aides who have left in the last 18 months, you know, starting with Michael Flynn and going down yeah, the list. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the turnover in this White House, the, there's always turnover in any White House, but this White House has been unprecedented. They are flying out the door faster than they're walking in. CNN just, put a, a, a graphic I saw up, that and it graphic. looked like it looked like a high school yearbook page. Yeah, yeah. It had that many people. It's like the screen is not big enough to hold. Yeah. The, their little faces get smaller and smaller because they have to cram so many more on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, it's just stunning. And what does that say about... You know the disarray in the in the Trump White House, right? Everything is fine, right? No, yeah. <laughs> everything is normal. No, well, well oiled machine. Well oiled machine. I think Brookings did a study, and this is quite a while ago, about sort of the you know monitoring the turnover rate and compared it to you know that of Obama and you know Bush forty three and Clinton and you know Trump was far outpacing other administrations when it came oh, to far out, way way to, way. You know way. and. To the distinction of sort of senior administration officials, yeah, uh, having them you know come and go very quickly. Right. Um, you were uh, at the White House a Sunday evening. Uh, no, Monday. Monday evening, evening. Monday evening. For the phony swearing-in ceremony, which uh, Hillary Clinton, I think, uh, accurately called a political rally. It was, it, it was unusual. It was unusual. It? What was it? What was the mood there? Of course, jubilant. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously, all the press is sort of like you know squished in the back, but you've got, you know, Republican members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. You do have, uh, which which I, I guess I was kind of surprised by, but maybe shouldn't have been, all eight members of the Supreme Court, so all the liberals were obviously there as well. And it must have been awkward well, for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, Sonia Sotomayor. I mean, I think they've sat, sat through Kendrick. enough uh, State of the Unions or slept through enough State of the yeah. Unions at this point. But that this, they... was, this was really a political rally. This was a gloating session on the part of for Mitch McConnell and company. I think that people, uh, I mean, he got a standing <laughs> ovation when he came in. McConnell did. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, when Trump started and he, and he gave that apology to Brett Kavanaugh, I think that you know most of the press was really was quite surprised that 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 happened, and then in Kavanaugh's speech when he was sort of talking about being a champion for women and hiring these four female law clerks, I mean obviously he's he's trying to sort of make up for all that has happened, but I mean the whole it, it was funny I was talking to another reporter downstairs afterward and and she and I were both like well there's a there's a lot to unpack there there's a lot to write about because. I mean, you know, these things are usually pretty ceremonial and, and pretty quick. And, you know, here's the oath, like a couple words, couple words, and you're done. But but this definitely had a lot of news out of it just because it was it was not normal. Right. It was a, it was a kind of in your face, you know, to the were there any Democrats on the from the committee there? I don't believe so. Probably, um, were, probably weren't invited. It, per, perhaps Manchin was invited, but I, I looked for him and I didn't see him in the audience. I did, however, see Laura Ingram from Fox News, so she was there. 
because you know why not? Well, I'm I'm su- Good grief. I'm surprised the entire primetime lineup and Fox and Friends. I mean, did not see Hannity there, but but Laura Ingram was definitely in the audience, and then she took a selfie, so I knew for sure that that blonde chick was definitely her. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, but it was a pep rally, you know. It was a pep rally, it, and it you was know. a political. It was a political pep rally, absolutely. Yeah, and then Donald Trump actually, and also telling Brett Kavanaugh, in addition to apologizing on behalf of the American people. Um, I mean, we're supposed to feel sorry for this guy. He's got a lifetime and he's appointment innocent. to the Supreme Court. Telling him that he's in the, he was proven innocent. Proven innocent in the, in the committee hearing. I mean, Trump has done a number of things in the last couple of weeks where I really question, you know, if he's sort of thinking at all politically, strategically, because I can't imagine some of this stuff is playing well with sort of those suburban women voters that he is going to need at some point again. And I imagine some of this rhetoric is probably alienating, you know, when it comes to that voting block. But he's just sort of doubled down and he's more about riling up his base than anything right now. Well, let's certainly hope so. And I think I I do believe I agree with you. I believe that. Pardon me, that, that that is the case. Um, meanwhile, somebody else who stepped into the political arena this week um, with uh, quite a response, Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, from indeed. From Tennessee. From yeah, Tennessee. Jumping in. And she's been very careful in the past to, to kind of not reveal her political leanings. Yeah, and, and actually got uh, whacked for it because I know Katy Perry, who, you know, she had this long fight with, you know, the pop star, uh, brawl but uh but even katie perry who had you know stumped for hillary from day one was like her first her first big appearance in iowa was with katie perry she went after taylor swift years ago and said you know you should be using your voice for good and taylor swift finally did uh on sunday night and she basically backed two local or local-ish candidates uh governor bredesen who's running for the senate seat and then the local congressman uh from her nashville district and it's interesting. I'm, I'm working on a piece now as to whether or not that will actually sort of move the dial. And one of my sources, who's a Democrat from the state, was saying that that he thought that, you know, she actually does have more pool uh, because she's she stayed local. She's considered, you know, a woman of Tennessee. Uh, she's known throughout the state. And the fact that she decided, you know, whenever she finally moved into politics to actually talk about you know, a state race as opposed to a national election, he thinks that she'll actually her her uh, her endorsement might actually have some impact. You know, I saw I, I saw thought some... it was very smart of her to to when she comes out of the closet, if you will, yeah, to focus on her home state. Yeah, I saw a story, uh, Vote dot org, which is a nonprofit that talks about they like help people get registered yep. and tell them how to do it. They said that sixty five thousand people got registered. And it's, uh, I think it's almost double that now. Yeah, that, was yeah, yeah. that was in the first 24 hours. That was in the first 24 hours. After said that she after she made her endorsement, it was the second biggest day for traffic that they'd seen on their website at vote.org. The first was National Voter Registration Day, which makes sense. I, but, you know, it's to, to, to what you guys were talking about, it, it's, you know, people just sort of assume that celebrities are going to, like, tell you, like, go vote for Barack Obama or go vote for the Democrat or whatever. And there is something to be said about, like, not getting involved in politics until, you know, it absolutely positively is going to resonate the loudest, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And 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 that's a key race. That's a race is extremely tight. And Marsha Blackburn is a real extreme Republican. Uh, She's been on the national stage since sort of the infancy of the Tea Party movement. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, another source well, was talking about the fact that she is not the type of Republican who's in the Senate now for Tennessee. You know, you've got uh, Lamar, Alexander Lamar Alexander and, and Bob yeah. Parker who are, are considered to be more moderate. Right. And so that's why it looks like, you know, Bredesen uh, could potentially get in there because he's sort of a known quantity in the state. He's a very he's, popular, he's a, very you know, popular Democratic governor. But for millennials, they don't remember him when he was governor. And for also progressives in the state, they were a little mad that he said that he would have voted yes for Kavanaugh. So what Taylor Swift has done has introduced him to a new generation of voters in her state potentially, but also sort of mitigated some of the damage with progressives that he might have caused by basically so, saying that he would have voted for Kavanaugh. So what does she have about a hundred million <laughs> Twitter I, I, followers? I think it's, or it's something? something insane. She's got she probably has as many as Donald Trump, doesn't she? Twitter followers. I, I had a source tell me that, you know, when it comes to Tennessee there would be nobody as important when it came to a political endorsement than Taylor Swift after Donald Trump. Donald Trump would be a big deal, obviously, and also Taylor Swift. 
By the way, uh, she has a beautiful house also in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, if, we, if we had time, I could flip through my <laughs> uh, uh, my photos here and show you Taylor Swift's house in, in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Ooh. It's their her beach house, uh, and it's beautiful. So she doesn't spend all of her time in Tennessee. But That's she's fair. still, she's in Tennessee. I thought she had a place in New York as well, because I remember that she was a may, big thing, that, yeah. she, that she got a spot in New York City. But. So... Um, it, 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 so, so many other items in the news we haven't had a chance to talk about. Um, uh, North Korea comes up on two fronts th- these days, two weird fronts. One is a Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump are also already talking about a second summit. Yes. Singapore the, part two. The love affair. <laughs> right. You know, we're, we, we, I love him. We love him. Uh, and there's, and Donald Trump now says they want their second summit. Both of them want the second summit to be at Mar-a-Lago. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, remember the days when presidents would go to places like Camp David? Yes, yes. You know, or maybe Geneva. I Trump, mean, some Trump place seemed that, briefly charmed by Camp David. He was, he was going up there. He went up there a couple times. Well, he's gone there more than Obama. But yeah. he hasn't gone there a lot, right? But, yeah. Yeah. Um, this this again to me this gets again the only place Trump goes are to his own properties really, it's it's the Trump International Hotel yeah, yeah. which you've followed too many times or the Sterling International Golf Course or Mar-a-Lago or, or Bedminster. Bedminster New Jersey yeah right and he's never and so the president of China, President Xi comes to the United States where do they go where do they meet not in the White House they meet in Mar-a-Lago you know which is all about. Getting more attention to Donald Trump's property so yeah. people will pay more to join his freaking golf club. And the fees have gone up. Yes. Yeah. Right. Imagine. So international summit in uh, at maybe Mark Lago. And then the other thing is that Kim Jong-un has invited the Pope to visit North Korea. <laughs> After, uh, I, you know, I love Pope he's, Francis. He's, he's a man he of cannot, the world now. Now yeah, that he's right. met with Trump, he's, you know. Forget about, He's all, his sins. forget about all the people I've butchered, right? Forget about all the members of my family that I've personally, that I've personally ordered, had murdered. murdered, right? Forget about all the political prisoners who are now in these camps, concentration Including camps. Including Americans almost. that have, yes, you know. in North mm-hmm. Korea. Forget about all them. And, and forget about the fact that I won't allow any freedom of religion in my country, but I want the Pope to come. Well... You know, he conned Donald Trump into a meeting, so maybe he can, he can con the Pope it's, into it's a meeting. It's just so bizarre. I know. But you, you know, you, you have to, you have to wonder whether some of these stories come up, whether it's for real or they're just. <laughs> I, I mean, I was with Dennis Rodman in Singapore and and followed him there, and it was crazy. What were you doing in? Singapore with Dennis Rodman. Well, because Dennis Rodman. That's just for fun, Bill. You yeah. Don't get, you no, I was, I was. For vacation. I, I, I followed Dennis Rodman to Singapore and, you know, and interviewed him. Uh, actually, Were you there for the summit? I was there to cover Dennis Rodman, who was there to be on the sidelines of the summit. And I interviewed him at our hotel pool, actually, as uh, Kim and Trump were signing that document. And it was it was fascinating because if you think about it, the one person that knows both of these leaders yeah. prior to them meeting each other was Dennis Rodman, the basketball player, because he had been <laughs> in North Korea multiple times, and obviously he had been on Celebrity Apprentice. God help us. Six so, degrees of of Dennis Rodman. Well, is Rodman still on the scene now? I mean, now that Kim has Trump, why does he need Dennis Rodman? You know, I, I, the, the words Dennis Rodman on the scene is sort of terrifying. But, it is. I mean, you know, to, to, to Nikki's point, I mean, he was definitely being interviewed around the summit. I mean, yeah. he was out yeah. there a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he gave I, – I tried to get him first, but they, they gave him to Chris Cuomo first. And he had this sort of now famous interview where he was, like, crying because he had been, you know – uh, people had sort of hated on him so badly for him going to North Korea. And he's like, but no, this is happening. And, you know, he felt like he like helped sort of open the door to this summit, which actually I don't I don't think he's wrong about. I think that, I don't he, either. that he he did. You but know, I just I just I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not he, when I say still on the scene, because I haven't heard 
I mean, now Donald Trump has sort of taken over yeah. and saying, we don't need you anymore, kid. Go back to basketball. And I something. haven't heard I anything know. about him being named like a special envoy or, or anything like that. Well, but, you know, maybe we we're talking about next U.N. ambassador, Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. <laughs> but he is he is appearing no, publicly. No, no, no. In Kanye a, West has a job. Oh, that's right. That's right. Can you hear? That's right. <laughs> yeah. After what? So today that he's coming Thursday. to the White House? Thursday. And what's that all about? I, uh, <laughs> I just, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Kim, yeah, I, Kim, your Kim, his, Kim Kardashian, his <laughs> wife, always be, obviously has also visited the White House twice uh, in the last like, six months uh, to talk about sort of criminal justice reform and you know getting certain people you know pardoned. And so I I I, I believe part of the conversation with Kanye is going to be in that realm. But I think it was also about like manufacturing, which I don't know maybe because he's a clothing designer. There's a connection there. Uh, I know that on Thursday I'll be standing in the Sean Spicer memorial bushes with the binoculars, like trying <laughs> to make sure that I can like see him, so I can say like Kanye arrived for his uh, his meeting at such and such a time and left at such and such a time. Are they going to have a joint news conference? <sighs> Man, I wish. Oh like, boy, I don't think we can handle that. I mean, yeah. my Not head might the explode. Of weeks we've had, yeah, that's <laughs> just too much. I just oof. All right. You see, there is so much going on, man. We are, and we just 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 scratch the surface here of all the news of the day here on the Bill Press Show so far. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Nikki and I will be joined by Kate Martell. Uh, she writes the great uh, twelve thirty report for the for the Hill, the Hill dot com. Uh, so stay with us. Quick break. We'll be right back, and we'll get into more trouble when we come back. This is the Bill Press Show. In four days. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children. She didn't know what to do. Did you have a good day at school? She gave them some broth. Without any bread. Kiss them all soundly. Night night. Good night. And put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Awkward. Do I look familiar? I should. You might remember me from here. Here. Or maybe even here. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. It can actually be a perfect moment to reach out to a friend and ask if they're okay if they seem down. It doesn't matter how you say it. You all right? Everything's okay? All G. You all right, girl? Oh, you cool? You bug and dog. Just show you're there for them. Go on, Kelly. Seize the awkward. Hey, um... You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Do you want to retire like a champ? Just like legendary basketball star Uncle Drew? Don't do it like that, Uncle Drew! You're already acing the game. You've got your dream ride. Don't be slamming my door. Sorry about that. Uh, you just did this. Nah, gotta get the boys. Your dream vacation and your dream team. And now you can make your retirement just as legendary. I get buckets. Get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. It's a big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. Yeah, and it's the huge. salary. Oh, my God, yes. Right? I mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents and <laughs> right before, the, yeah, so it saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know. Thank you. It's nice to hear that from <laughs> These are cool. Uh, did you, um, did you?
Follow us on Twitter at BP Show. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, you bet it is Wednesday, October 10, uh, the Bill Press Show, live from Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. And uh, our studio right here on Capitol Hill, just down the street from the United States Capitol building, where the Senate is still in session. The House is out. Um, they're out campaigning, but Mitch McConnell doesn't want doesn't want to let the Democrats out to campaign for re-election. Uh, so he's <laughs> keeping them here in Washington. And we're brought to you today by the United Steelworkers and their international president, Leo Girard, the United Steelworkers. North America's largest industrial union representing over 1.2 million active and retired members. We certainly salute them, thank them for their good work. And I want to remind you again, a whole new player on the scene, but very, very exciting for progressive radio. Uh, there's a new website called leftisright.com, leftisright.com. Uh, and you can, that's available at the app PVN, Political Voices Network. You can download it uh, and you will get immediate access to three great progressive shows, uh, yours truly, Bill Press Show, The Stephanie Miller Show, and The Tom Hartman Show, all there on leftisright.com. So download the app, um, PVN, Political Voices Network, and you are in business. We're in business here with Nikki Schwab from the New York Post. As a friend of Bill the entire hour. Hello. Nikki from, where did you say? Pennsylvania. Lincoln West, here, a tiny yeah. town in western Pennsylvania. Western Pennsylvania. Outside of Pittsburgh. And from The Hill, thehill.com, Kate Martell, who's the uh, a publisher, author, creator of the 1230, the great 1230 report on The Hill, which I check every single day and enjoy. It's really a good sprightly look at the news in the middle of the day. <laughs> Thanks Hi, Kate. for reading it. Good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been like sort of all capital news all the time, but Donald Trump is actually looking forward to what might happen next year. Uh, he talked yesterday about how many Supreme Court nominees <laughs> he might actually be called upon to make next year. I find this pretty stunning. Here we are. A lot of theories on that. It could be three. Under one theory, it could be four. And then some people could say two could happen. So, you know, it could anywhere be from, I would say, one or two to four additional. Wow. <laughs> God forbid. So, first of all, uh, ladies, that could not happen, right, because in a presidential year, we do not let the Senate pick a, pres a Supreme Court nominee. We wait until the American people vote. Isn't that correct? Well, so... Uh, Lindsey Graham last week actually said that he would he would you know keep that as precedent, in that follow um, the Merrick Garland. Yeah, precedent? he said that at the Atlantic Festival on stage. Uh, he'd he'd been booed also during that appearance. I, I might add because he was talking about how unfairly Brett Kavanaugh had been treated. Uh, but you know the the liberals in the audience their ears perked or, perked up when he made this promise. Mm -hmm. Now, then, at the press conference on, gosh, what day was that? Saturday, uh, Mitch McConnell then said, eh, I don't know about that. Uh, and then I believe uh, Chuck Grassley on Fox News last night was like, oh, no, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll, keep that, we'll keep that seat open, you know, just like that we, you know, uh, we sort of forced the Democrats into doing uh, in 2016. Mm -hmm. So there's already a, a fight among the Republicans as to whether or not they would, uh, you know, heed their own precedent on that uh, matter. Actually, Kate, as I recall, Mitch McConnell, you're right. He said, no, we would go ahead next year because— now he's changed the goalpost again, I think, that it's when the president is of the opposite party to the Senate, that's when you don't allow the Senate to, so he, you know, he's trying to make up this new rule. Finding but, little caveats in there, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I don't see a scenario where they're nominating four people for the Supreme Court in the next few years, but okay, I mean, it, if that's going to rally the troops. For he thinks, and then you know. <laughs> well, well, start to think about who who the hell is he talking about? Obviously, he's thinking Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Steve <laughs> Breyer, oh. Steve Breyer. But then, if, in terms of age, I don't have all of them right in front of me. Then the next oldest, I think, is Clarence Thomas. Yeah, or maybe yeah. he's even older than Breyer. I don't know, right? Uh, but the others are all pretty. Sotomayor, young. Kagan, there. Yeah. Sotomayor, they're, Kagan, John Roberts. Yeah, young Al, Alito, Gorsuch. We're forgetting somebody, I guess there, but they're all you know in their fifties or so. Yeah, yeah. So 
I don't know who he's Where's naming. Where's coming up with four? Unless he's thinking yeah. somebody may resign to it, give him a seat. But, but why? Wh- yeah. who, who, I mean, the liberals are not going anywhere. No. Yeah. And the none, of, those conser- are, none of the conservatives are going to resign to yeah. give him, let him replace, another, replace them with another conservative. I mean, an unnecessary fight. Go. Yeah. I, I just, I was stunned when he said could be four. Also, why would he want to go through that again? Like, I mean, the Kavanaugh oh. stuff. I mean, I think, you know, he obviously came out on. Uh, if, if he could make it six. through it. If he's got it five, four now. If he could make it six, three, you bet he would do it. But I'm saying yeah. with if a conservative justice. Oh, you know, I see what I, you mean. I, well, yeah, I don't, right. I don't think he's yeah. going to, like, try to push Clarence Thomas to, no. to peace out so he can, yeah. like, go through another, like, really hostile, like, nomination fight through the Senate. Like, that as, seems As like, an asinine. election is going, as a presidential yeah. election is yeah, going like, on. why would you do that to yourself? I mean, if we have another confirmation fight, I know I'm calling out sick that I don't think even Trump yeah, I'm would want to I'm taking a month-long <laughs> vacation after this one. <laughs> no. Uh, I think uh, maybe just the bottom line is, as usual, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Can we just leave it at that? Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe he can't count to nine? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the big question is um, uh, that a lot of people are raising, uh, and there's been a lot of talk in the Hill and the Post about this both. Um, what is the impact of the Kavanaugh nomination going to be on the midterm elections? What do you think? Uh, are, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is saying this gives us the adrenaline that we need. As we said yesterday, um, Mitch McConnell is the last person who should use the word adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Talk about somebody who puts you to sleep. When you talk. Uh, but they are claiming that it's going to wake up um, white men, right, to come back and vote, out, uh, vote. Even some Republican women who are outraged at the way Kavanaugh was treated. I don't follow that logic. On the other hand, um, Democrats are saying this is really going to rally women, particularly to come out and vote in the midterms. How do you see it, Kate? I think and Nikki? it's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Democrats, Republicans won the fight, and yes, I know McConnell is saying it's going to anger these the white male voters, but at the end of the day, looking at the protests on Capitol Hill, um, there were a few pro Kavanaugh protesters, but they're all anti. There, most of them were anti Kavanaugh. Yeah. I'd say ninety percent of the people I saw outside of the Hill were protesting Kavanaugh and excited. I, I can't even, it's anecdotal, but looking on social media, um, how many posts I saw of anti-Kavanaugh protests versus pro, that it just seems to really have sparked a nerve with um, with Democratic voters. And suburban white female voters are going to be a big demographic for the midterms. I think that that's what Democrats are targeting right now, and that's what Republicans should be the most worried about, that I think that's kind of a line that Republicans are going to use that sure McConnell's going to say it's going to help Republicans. But at the end of the day, they won. It didn't really it kind of seemed to spark a fire for Democrats, not as much for Republicans in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. I actually think it absolutely. I think it would have helped Republicans at the ballot box had the nomination actually been derailed. I think then they would, you know, that yeah. that intensity would have maybe stayed through the beginning of November. I think now they they potentially go back to complacency, and you've got Democrats that are still really, really mad, really mad. I mean, people I know that are not that involved in politics are incensed over what happened with Brad Kavanaugh. And women, particularly because of the way she was treated. Absolutely, and and, th- and <laughs> women across the board have been treated by. Donald Trump, Roy Moore, Roger Ailes, Bill O'Reilly, you know. And and, and, and now if if you Brett watched Kavanaugh. Trump at his rallies last week when he actually went after Christine Blasey Ford and was making fun of her and making fun of her testimony, oh, was it one beer? Ha ha ha. I think that was a huge misstep for the president. I think his base at that moment was like, yeah, that's great. But I think that that really hurt him potentially with women. And then that comment he made about Al Franken and that like, oh, you know, what a what a wiener for like, you know, resigning from Congress yeah, yeah, and, and right. not and not, you know, sort of laughing off these sexual why harassment did, allegations. Why didn't you do it like me? Why didn't you call them liars and make fun of them and deny it? And Exactly. And, yeah. Like those two instances last week, I really, you know, and I'm not surprised by that much these days. But I was really surprised that he went there because I was wondering, you know, why would you alienate this voting block that you're really going to need? And not just in 2018, but for re-election in 2020. President Trump did not win by that many votes. And if you're going to alienate suburban women in Midwestern states, not good. Not yeah. good for him. Um, our mutual friend Alexi McCammon on Axios reported yesterday about all the money that's been flowing in to Democratic coffers. 
uh, since the Kavanaugh hearings uh, and during the Kavanaugh hearings. Like uh, Act Blue raised $10 million <laughs> on October 5, Thanks. $9 million on October 6. Um, and one Republican <laughs> strategist told her, I love this quote, he said, Yes, Kavanaugh is animating white, college-educated women. But guess what? This is a Republican strategist. But guess what? They were not voting for a Republican a month ago, and they're still not voting <laughs> for a Republican. <laughs> yeah, so it's animating them even more so to yeah. go out. And, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Right across the river, Virginia 10, Barbara Comstock, in her first term, a, a total Trump. She's become. Yeah. She wasn't. She's become a total Trumper. She's 12 points down today. Yeah, she's a And she's the Washington goner. Post front page story today, and they asked the people in the district who are voting for Jennifer Wexton, her opponent, why? Number one reason, Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that I would be shocked if the Democrats don't easily win back the House. Now, I think the Senate is, is probably a bit out of reach, uh, but you never know. I mean, you got the Taylor Swift bump potentially, so... <laughs> And, and that that has helped when you look at those vote.org numbers, you know, they argue that, you know, she probably helped in Tennessee, but she's helped nationally. And one of the states that saw a huge uptick in voter registration is Texas. And so, I mean, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, but if if that if those voters were predominantly vote, registering to vote as Democrats, I mean, that spells trouble for Ted Cruz. You know, there's an interesting story either in the Post or the New York Times this morning, that um, one ba- one group that Beto O'Rourke is picking up in Texas are evangelical women. Huh. Huh. Not, and he is pro-choice. Yeah. But they don't like Donald Trump's treatment of women and Donald Trump's lifestyle. And, and Donald Trump's particularly... One issue was with the uh, ripping the kids away from their mothers at the border. Mm, yeah. And one woman is quoted as saying, I care as much about babies at the border as I do babies in the womb. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, and because he's, so, he's held the evangelical vote. Trump has. Yeah. Oh, yeah, before, because of particularly abortion and same-sex marriage. Yeah, which has always been, I always thought was sort of Brett surprising Cattle. because of his, you know, obviously, I mean, he, he's not lived the most... Uh, pious lifestyle, if you will. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care as long as he will appoint anti And he Roe has v- been good if you are pro-life. Wa- Anti-Roe v. Wade people to the Supreme Court. That's all they care about. Yeah, yeah. And I would say anti-same-sex marriage too, which they'll try to undo that. You watch. This 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 court could very well. Um, so, Kate, one other thing. Um, what do we... <laughs> What do we think about oh, Hope Hicks? Got a new job, right? <laughs> the question is, if she goes from being communications director at the White House, at the Trump White House to communications director at Fox News, is that really a different job? <laughs> I mean, it's definitely not going to bring Fox News even more to the middle and, you know, a little less Trumpy than we're seeing now. Um, yeah, Trump praised her and he loves this. This is great for him. He already, he loves Fox News and now he has one of his his first communications director, one of his first campaign staffers, now you know has an in over at Fox that this is just only going to – he loves this. <laughs> so, so, Nikki, it's sort of like Bill Shine and Hope Hicks just sort of changed jobs, right? I, I think so. I, I'm unclear as to whether it's actually – because it's, it's sort of that new Fox company. It's the new Fox, they call it. But it does include Fox News. I believe so. It does. Okay. It does. So, I mean, no, it does. Okay. It does. And Fox <laughs> Business, their part. It's sort of what – Rupert couldn't sell to whoever bought 20th Century or whatever, whoever bought it, right? Yeah, I've, I've, I've but the new lost unit the, of... that she's communications director of that absolutely includes Fox News and Fox Business. I, I and laugh Fox though because. Fox Sports and other stuff too, but. She's, she's moving to Los Angeles for this job. So she's going to be West Coast based. So it's like, sure, she's at Fox, but she's like as far away uh, from Washington as she possibly can be, <laughs> which is sort of funny. Yeah. But it's not the first time that Donald Trump has looked to Fox News for as as for, for a source of new jobs. Yeah, right? for talent. Larry, yeah, in the Larry, White House. Larry I mean, Cud- obviously Bill Shine, Bill Larry Shine, Cudlow, Larry Cudlow, Gorka, <laughs> um, Joe DeGeneva. At one point, he liked him because he mm-hmm. saw him on Fox News. Yeah, 
And there was uh, there was talk of I'm forgetting. Laura his, Ingram was considered for yeah, press secretary yeah, at like one point. Some of their per, the talking heads were considered to be you know potentials for the comms department at some point, right. some point along the way. Now, so Kate, before you got here, Nikki and I were trying to figure out who's going to be the. Oh, well, no, two questions. What's Haley? What's Nikki Haley going to do next? And who's going to be the new um, representative to the United Nations? So do you have the answers? Are you all the answers? You, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. No, I'm, co- I'm confused why Nikki Haley would announce this four weeks before the midterms. <laughs> um, Trump did t- try to spin it positively yesterday, saying that. She told me this months ago. This has been the plan. She's staying through the year. But then why not announce it in four weeks? Just wait until November 7th. Um, what she's going to do. Yeah, she what, was the, what was the urgency of yesterday? And also, like, the, the letter was dated for last week, the resignation letter. Was it? Yeah. And so, she, okay, let's. So, Bill Shine is the communications director, right? Is he going to say, no, this is the perfect time to announce this, that our, that our ambassador to is leaving? Is 27 days before the midterms. And also right after... He cannot have made that recommendation. Trump wants to take a victory lap on Kavanaugh. Yeah. And then you've got another news... I mean, this has been... The the entirety of of the Trump, you know, White House has been, you know, something that they could actually tout or like infrastructure week and then it just gets blown up by like another news story and they've done it again. And Haley didn't even use the excuse of it's for personal reasons. That's like the go-to of I want out of a job Spending and don't time want with my to family. Stay. Exactly. She didn't even have a personal <laughs> reason. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I have no idea why she wouldn't leave. Um, obviously, there is um, there are theories that because John Bolton and Mike Pompeo are leaning in the other direction that she's was kind of forced out and was losing her influence and was had like a tougher stance on Russia and that she's just been unhappy for a while and wanted to make it happen, but absolutely no no idea why she would do this 27 It, it is true, I think, as some people pointed out, that she had a much stronger role when Tillerson was at state yeah, because yeah. he was considered pretty weak. And, and Bolton Donald, wasn't there. And Bolton wasn't there yet, right? Now Pompeo's at state. Trump has a much closer relationship with Pompeo. He's he's a bigger player, and Bolton is there. So her role has diminished. And Bolton, it seems like he wants to like burn down the UN. So I mean, <laughs> he's not clearly not a fan of that institution yeah. so much. But at the same yeah. time, the post of U.S. the U.S. ambassador to the UN has always been a secondary post to under most administrations. Republican or Democrat to National Security Advisor or Secretary of State. But now it's They're, glamorous, Bill. It's a glamorous position. In the past now. two years, glamorous. Because Nikki Haley has made it glamorous. <laughs> she has. Well, she has. that's. I mean, that's the the language that Trump yeah. used. Yeah, but others have been there. I mean, Adlai Stevenson and Susan Rice and uh, Madeleine Albright. I mean, they were stars, but at the same time, they were. Yeah. They were in the foreign policy tier. They were never like number one, right? They were on the team, but they were yeah. never number one. So. But she was for a while, I guess. Maybe that was it. Or, as we pointed out, she just wants to get in a position where she'd be ready to move in any direction she can. She certainly is not out of politics. She's not running in 2020, though. <laughs> she says. She says, yeah. I, I mean, she's 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 said that she's out before, you know, the Republicans potentially get crushed in the midterms. And so, you know, that's she can sort of wash her hands of that. But still, it, it doesn't. It, it made no sense within the concept of, like, the news cycles for, to do it yesterday. One story that's getting more and more attention uh, is um, a, a, a very sad story and a troubling story. The plight of um, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who, according to the Turkish government, uh, entered the Saudi consulate in Istanbul uh, last week and never left it. And was the Turkish Turks say was murdered by um, a, t- a team of people who came in. Now we know more. We're learning more about it. There was an actually a, an, a squad of fifteen men from Saudi Arabia who landed in Istanbul that day, went to the consulate, le- and flew out of the Turkey that night, having <sighs> done their job, which they say was to murder and dismember the body of oh, Khashoggi oh with a bone saw that they brought from uh. Saudi Arabia. I mean, it is frightening. And and Donald Trump's response is, I don't know anything about it. I mean, people are saying, when are you going to express some outrage about this? I mean, and demand some answers. But it's a journalist. Well, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah, he's a journalist, so why should we care? I mean, that's what a lot of people are saying. Well, I mean, 
Pompeo has said this. We, we, we need to know some answers. Yeah. Donald Trump himself has not said anything yet other than he said it yesterday walking out to Marine One. You know, uh, I don't know anything about it. I don't like it, but I don't know anything about it. We'll see how – was it wasn't Peter? He, we'll see how it sorts out or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I'm waiting for him to to go back on that. He keeps tweeting as we speak. Yeah, I keep my, waiting my to see. Watch is he's on buzzing. Oh, okay. He's tweeting about the hurricane right now, but I keep checking. I, I'm waiting for him to reverse that and say something um, a little stronger, rather than I, I don't know anything about this. We'll see how it sorts out. Yeah, here he was. So here he was yesterday. Really, sort of a almost doesn't really give a damn. I am concerned about it. I don't like hearing about it, and hopefully that will sort itself out sort right itself now out. nobody knows anything about it but there's some pretty bad stories going around i do not like it okay yeah why not well, i don't it? think anyone likes it yeah, no. No one. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why but this is a washington post strongest? person so i mean you know president trump hasn't exactly been uh, great to the press well it does um, raise the issue about whether whether all of his negative comments about the media have emboldened other dictators around the world to act out against the media because yeah, what yeah. the hell? So okay, if Donald Trump can get away with it, why can't we? I believe there's evidence to to suggest that that you know journalists are are getting jailed more frequently and in danger more frequently because of his rhetoric. But uh, and then particularly troubling because of Donald Trump's relationship with the Saudi leadership, mm-hmm. the new Saudi mm-hmm. leadership, and. Uh, um, his unwillingness to be critical of them on many fronts, yeah. and now this in particular. I mean, we don't know that we don't have the evidence yet. We don't know they, in fact, did it. But the Turkish government, um, which has they have raised questions of their own. I mean, Erdogan is not necessarily <laughs> someone who has treated journalists <laughs> no. well either. No. Uh, probably the worst, right? And one of the worst. Yeah, right? not not good. But they're saying that that that. that that this guy was killed and that he never walked out. The Saudis are saying he can't. This is crazy, too. Well, he came in the front door because there's pictures of him going yeah. in, but they say he left through a secret back door. Why? 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 And where's the proof of life if he's still kicking? You know, like yeah. he's not. <laughs> it's an easy thing to prove. <laughs> and if they have cameras at the front door, you know they have cameras at the back door, too. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it's this. And I don't think he's, you know, faking his death. Like, was it a a Ukrainian Uh, journalist who who (laughs) faked his death? Oh, and then popped up at a news conference. Yeah. (laughs) No, I don't think I don't think we. I don't think I don't think it was. We'll see how this plays out. But it's troubling (laughs) that the president hasn't spoken out on it yet. Um, But he's off on another uh, rally today, Kate, up to um, Erie, Pennsylvania. Yep. Um, yeah, he has another. So I guess it's it's expected because the presidential election is this this uh, is it, it's coming up in three weeks, right? We're going to yeah. the presidential Iowa, election. Iowa yesterday, <laughs> Pennsylvania today, Ohio and Kentucky. He's <laughs> you'd think this was 2020 <laughs> or at least 2019. Yeah, he's doing a lot of these rallies, and I think what's interesting, like from listening to his rally last night, is you would think that Republicans are holding on to the House and Senate by just a hair. He makes it sound like. If you can't get out to vote, then there's no chance that we'll keep either chamber. And it, it was kind of a different. He puts himself on the chopping block more than you would expect during a midterm year for a president. But he's worried. I mean, if he loses either it, chamber, it puts him in perilous. They're position. presidential rallies. They really are. I mean, he's been running since yeah. he was sworn in. I guess right. Yeah. The candidates and that's it. two minutes. Hey, Nikki, great to see you today. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Uh, and Kate, great to see you too. This Thanks so much for being here. Have a great day, folks. Show. See you tomorrow.